Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we are going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cassie Carroll. I am with the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center or CDAC, um, the Marketing and Outreach uh, Program Manager. Um, and today we're going to be speaking about how we can use data to assess and improve our operations, to increase energy efficiency, and also just be um, stewards, good stewards of our plants and uh, maintenance moving forward. So we have an all-star panel today. Um, two of my colleagues from CDAC are here, Robert Nemeth and Kamau Heyman uh, are both here and joining us. We have Brian Tucker from the Sangamon County Water Reclamation District. And we also have Danny Blagojevich from Xylem Digital Solutions today. So we'll have uh, presentations um, throughout the majority of our session for today, but we'll have time at the end of our session for questions and answer. Um, if you're new to Zoom, uh, there's some great functions that you can use. If you want to chat with us, feel free um, to open up the chat. It should be at the bottom of your screen. It says chat. Feel free to chat with us um, or our panelists throughout the presentation. If you do have questions, um, there is the Q&A box. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Please feel free to answer, put any questions that you have throughout the session in that Q&A box, and we will answer and address all questions at the end of the session. Um, another note, uh, we will be recording today's session. So if you'd like to go back and review the session at a later date or share it with colleagues, feel free to do so. Um, we'll make that available on YouTube uh, later today and send you the recording um, at, 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 via email. So if uh, at all, if you're interested in CEUs or professional development hours, uh, we will be sending certificates to all those that are interested. I'll put my contact email in the uh, chat, but please feel free to send an email um, for your interest in CEUs. Uh, the course number today is 15564 for Illinois EPA um, operators and credits towards today's course for one CEU. Um, so again, please uh, message me if you'd like a certificate as well, and we'll get you that and you can get credit for today's session. All right, uh, enough, uh, enough introduction of today's session. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Robert Nemeth, to kick off today's presentation. Robert, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, Cassie, I am trying to forward the uh, slides. There we go. Okay, I forwarded them too far. Okay, um, um, I'm from CDAC. I'm one of Cassie's uh, colleagues. Um, so here's some objectives of what I'd like to uh, cover in the first few minutes of this presentation. Um, I'm trying to get to the slide, the objective slide, Cassie, and it's not working too well. Oh, there we go. Okay, I would just want to show you, um, we perform a lot of uh, assessments of wastewater treatment plants, and there is just some basic data that we try to collect <clears throat> and uh, to perform our assessments. And I'd like to share some of um, that with you, how we perform that. It's sort of a high level assessment and how that high level assessment can um, point you in certain directions on things you might be interested in uh, uh, investigating at a, at a deeper level. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to use some of the, your very basic DMR data too. And then Kamau, will, uh, my other colleague will um, I talk about using energy consumption data at a lift station to identify problems. So I'm trying to forward to the next slide, Cassie. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so this is some of the first uh, information that we try to collect from um, wastewater treatment plants before we even go on site. It's to give us a feel for how uh, the wastewater treatment plants is potentially operating. So we try to get the uh, utility data, the kilowatt hours for each month, uh, the, the cost, uh, that's not quite as important to us, but the flow comes right off your DMR data and your precipitation data we download offline. Uh, you can only download it offline month by month at, at this Wonder Underground site that I've got listed on the left side. But uh, after you have your database built, uh, it's just a once a month um, um, venture to that site to get the current um, uh, 
precipitation, so it's really not a big deal once you have everything filled out. Um, if you have uh, never had an assessment by CDAC, we'd love to uh, do some of this work for you. Um, if you sign up for an assessment, we're always looking for plants to assess. <clears throat> Um, so this is some of the basic data we try to collect. And one of my colleagues said, well, you know, a lot of these operators don't have that uh, kilowatt hour information. Well, that is true. And that is a problem. That's a, a, a sign of uh, basically a communications breakdown. An operator really should be uh, provided that, that bill, a copy of that bill every month, because that's, there's some important information on that. Let me show you what we do with um, some of that information. Cassie, can you please forward the next slide? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so what we do is we take that information that you saw on that last slide, we create a benchmarking table. And of particular interest on this table is the electric use intensity. I've got it highlighted in red there, you'll see. It's a kilowatt hours per million gallons per year. It tells us, it gives us an inkling of how well a plant is performing. As you can see, this one's at 917 kilowatt hours per million gallons per year, which is good. This is very good. Um, <clears throat> And you'll see very soon that uh, there are much higher numbers that we encounter. But uh, so this this provides a uh, sort of a high level overview and it normalizes the data so we can compare one plant to another. And uh, uh, some plants don't use this. Was, this was for a plant that used just electricity. There was no natural gas usage, but uh, we'll sometimes have another column of data on that former page. Um, with therms in it too, monthly therm consumption. So next slide, please, Cassie. Thank you. <clears throat> so we take that flow uh, and uh, the kilowatt hours and we, we map that on a chart and uh, or plot it on a chart. And you can see here that, well, two things kind of stand out. There's an odd electrical usage pattern. You can see that we've got a high of over 100,000 and a low of 25,000. And you're kind of going, well, gosh, what's going on there? Sometimes it, these are easy to explain because they're billing errors or billing, billing issues um, uh, from the utility. Um, other times, you know, th these are questions that like, well, what's going on here at the plant? Um, and then we can see that there doesn't appear to be a lot of correlation to the uh, flow. Sometimes we'll see a flat line for energy consumption that basically shows that, well, everything's on running eight, uh, 87, 60 hours a year. Um, other times we'll see, and we'll see the flow going up and down. And sometimes we'll see the flow um, mimicking the energy consumption, which is something we really like seeing, which indicates a tight system, not much I and I. And also it indicates VFDs. So your, your, your consumption is uh, matching flow. Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. <clears throat> Thank you. So here we take that same data and we plot it uh, on a scatter chart. And you can see that relationship of the 0 0.06, the R squared up at the top there. That's not a good relationship. There really isn't much of a relationship, which basically was indicated on that, that former graph that I showed you too. Um, so we start asking questions, you know, why isn't there a closer relationship there? Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. So we'll take on that first chart that I showed you with all the numbers, <clears throat> we'll take the flow versus precipitation and chart that also. And here, all of a sudden, well, now here we see a pretty strong correlation. If you can go to the next slide, please, Cassie. So here we did it on a scatter plot, and it's a 0 0.79, so we call it 0.8 R squared. An R squared of one is a line falling on top of the uh, the trend line. So 0 0.79, that's a fairly decent relationship. So that tells us, well, there's definitely a relationship between how much rain falls and how much flow we're seeing in the plant. So that, uh, and you could do something like this for uh, lift stations too. You could compare energy consumption and rainfall for each lift station, and you could quickly identify which branch of your uh, system is leaking more than others and which one should uh, receive more attention than the other places. Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. Uh, and this is this is sort of uh, beyond what you can do. This is where we plot all the plants. You can see the 71 plants and the relationship there 
of uh, the R squared is 0.84, which is a pretty good relationship um, of all the plants, um, how much <clears throat> they'll fall on that line. You tell us what your flow is and we can come close to telling you how much energy you're using. Of concern are these numbers up here right there, the ones above the line. And if you can see on the right side, I pulled out just the fine bubble aerated wastewater treatment plants. And it's those plants that are above that line and makes you wonder, well, what's going on at these plants? If you drop that circle, those dots down to that line, that's quite a drop for at least three of those plants. And uh, that's, that's when you go, well, those plants are using more than the uh, average. So what's going on there? Next plant, uh, oh, slide, so thank you. Uh, here we can see just the benchmarking of the lagoons and trickling filters. And you can see there's a wide range. If you're down at the bottom end of that, well, you know, we got to scratch your head. We'll find some savings, but it won't be a lot. If you're up at the top of that, well, we start thinking that we can probably show, find some savings at these, uh, at that plant. And so all you need here is uh, flows from the DMR and utility data to do this, to sort of find out where you sit on that ranking. Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. So here's the, uh, here's the same chart, but for activated sludge plants, once again, you can see a huge range and quite a few of them under 2000, which is, was, is pretty darn good. I looked at uh, the 71 plants, you can see their fine bubble, there were 29 of those. Of the coarse bubble, there were 11. Uh, lagoons, nine, and oxidation ditch, there were 22. The oxidation ditch and others, uh, trickling filters and stuff like that. And you can see the average kilowatt hours per million gallons for those different uh, plants. You can see it's quite high for lagoons at almost 6,000 kilowatt hours per uh, uh, million gallons, but that's only nine data points too. So um, uh, that's, that's something to account for too. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in where do you fall on this chart? Well, let's give a call to CDAC. So next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what we do with some of your energy information, we try to disaggregate it um, to find out where is that energy flowing at the plant. You can see here that uh, this smaller plant had six aerators that summed up to, uh, and we knew how long they were running because four of them were 8760 and the others were 1500 hours. Um, so we can see that they used 223,486, that's, that's a ballpark, that's in the ballpark. You know, it's not exact, but it's close. So to get up to what the total plant use, we gotta find out, well, where's the rest of the electricity going? Well, it's going on the right side, you can see there's a chart. And we, this is a simple plant with nothing more than a shed and some other stuff. Uh, so it was easy to disaggregate. This gets much more complicated in large plants. And you can see, uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to skip over that, uh, that chart. This, this chart shows it better. This is a different plant. This is on the outfall side, <clears throat> looking at the dissolved oxygen levels. And it is a, uh, it's an aerated outfall, not a cascade outfall. So we're just, we're aerating after treatment to make sure that we're meeting that six uh, uh, milligrams per liter outfall. And you can see that during the winter, this is awfully consistent. During the winter times, there's a lot of oxygen and it may be just due to the nature of the plant, but it may be also because we're over aerating. So these, this is where we start asking the operator, would it be possible to slowly turn down your aerators and see what happens during the winter months when uh, the, the water can hold more oxygen? Uh, because we really don't need that much oxygen in the water. So, um, you know, we look at this data and this is right off your DMR data. And uh, uh, this is where we start asking questions and, 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 and talking to you and seeing, well, what can you do here to maybe uh, save some energy? Uh, next slide, please, Cassie. Uh, next slide, where I'm gonna skip over a couple ones here to let other people talk. Next one. Okay, so basic data, what's important? <clears throat> These are basically the four things that we like to get started with. Uh, energy consumption from utility bills uh, for the wastewater treatment plant and your lift stations, because we like looking at those two. Those could use up a 
use quite consume quite a bit of energy too. Um, motor run times, those are invaluable to us. Some places track these, others don't. Um, these are really important numbers because we can guess at them. You know, it's easy if you say, well, it's just on all the time, but if it's not on all the time, then we start guessing. And if you have the motor run times, there's nothing better than that. That's great. And then the DMR history, that's important to us. And the precipitation data, which we just get off online. So these are the what we would consider probably the four most important things at the very front end to start doing an energy assessment. And that's something uh, we'd be happy to help you set that up for your plant too. Um, uh, next slide, Cassie. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I uh, am gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kamal. Thank you. Um, cool. So, Cassie, you can actually. Um, I don't. I don't need the screen control. So, just to begin, uh, preventative maintenance can support your efforts in keeping your plant working at peak efficiency. Um, proactive plant management, although a little bit more work, will keep you ahead when it comes to maintenance and repairs. Uh, this approach has the potential to be more cost effective because you can detect equipment issues before they become costly and detrimental to plant performance, excuse me. <clears throat> um, some major issues could be temporary lapses in service or full-fledged outages. Um, reactive plant management, however, oh, could I get the next slide please, Cassie? My apologies. Oh. Um, could you actually go back? My apologies again. Um, so reactive plant management consists of only performing maintenance and service when equipment reaches the end of its predetermined service time. This approach has the potential to be more costly because it limits the possibility of early detection, which means that simple issues can go untreated for extended periods of time, um, resulting in larger, more serious issues. Um, so a lot can be determined about um, a plant based on readily available data and some simple calculations. Following a routine visit, um, a routine site visit at a local plant, CDAC engineers wanted to determine the feasibility of downsizing a pump from 20 to 15 horsepower. I will now walk through this calculation to determine, uh, to demonstrate how this approach can be used to evaluate pump performance. Um, so, thank you. The first step was to get the pump curve for the 20 horsepower pump using the information on the nameplate of the pump. Um, from this curve, we were able to determine that the peak flow rate was 1600 gallons per minute. Uh, from there, we summed the monthly runtime hours for the pump in question. Then we were able to calculate the expected monthly flow rate at full power or at the 1600 gallons per minute peak flow rate. Uh, this became our theoretical or expected value for monthly flow rate. We then compared these expected monthly flow rates to the observed monthly flow rates. Based on the comparison, we were able to conclude that the pump in question was working um, uh, harder than it needed to. Um, so here in this slide, in the blue box, we have the runtime hours for the two pumps for the month of March back in 2019. Um, these hours were summed and you can see really small at the bottom, the total. Um, from there, we multiplied the runtime hours with the peak flow rate to get the monthly flow rate in million gallons per month. Um, it should also be noted that we multiply with a factor of 60 to eliminate minutes and divided by a factor of 1 million to get the final unit of millions of gallons per month. Um, a simplified version of this calculation can be seen at the bottom of the page um, there. Thank you, Cassie. Um, in the orange box above, we have the expected monthly flow rate for March at the top. And this is based on the theoretical calculation we just did. Um, the flow rate in the second line is the observed flow rate for March and is based on the DMRs. Um, the percent difference can also be seen below that. Next slide, please. Um, in this slide, we can see um, a plot of the calculated versus the observed flow rates. 
um, the points on the x-axis are months, while the y-axis points correspond to flow rates. Um, in blue, we have the calculated monthly flow rates, while in orange, we have the actual flow rates based on the DMR data. We can see that there are some major discrepancies between the data, um, with, the with the exception of data points between months 9 and 15. Um, in conclusion, we were able to determine um, an inefficiency in a plant through the use of pump curve, monthly runtime hours, uh, discharge monitoring reports, and one very simple calculation. This is a simple, low-cost approach that can be used by any plant as a preliminary step to assessing performance and efficiency. That is all for me. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Robert and Kamau. Uh, the really oh. helpful information just about basic um, things that we should be thinking about when um, thinking about data and things that we can use that are at our fingertips. We don't need any kind of monitoring equipment. We just need our bills and our DMR flows to really understand some simple ways that we can identify um, energy saving opportunities. So thank you, Robert and Kamau for that um, great presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Tucker. He is the operations supervisor at the Sangamon County Water Reclamation District. And he has been in the wastewater treatment plant uh, field for 44 years. He's operated wastewater facilities and collection systems in Illinois, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. He has won Central PA WPCOA Operator of the Year in 1993. Um, he is a superstar, and I, he just told us he was nominated for Operator of the Year this year, too, for the Illinois Wastewater Professionals Conference and Association. So he has won so many different awards. Um, he is presently the Operations Supervisor uh, for Sangamon County and over 30 lift stations and two wastewater treatment facilities and two CSO treatment facilities with a combined total treatment capacity of 326 MGD. All right, I am going to share your slides, Brian, and you can take it away. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Um, mine keys in with what, with what Robert and Kamau have been talking about. Um, it's our job. It's not only the job of the operator to run the facility in compliance with state and federal guidelines and regs and also be the good neighbor, in other words, control the noise, control the odors, control the lights, um, and get rid of the byproduct, which is biosolids in a safe and environmentally friendly manner. But we're also expected to be cost effective. And that's a journey, it's not an objective. You're always looking to be more cost effective. In other words, your bosses are gonna ask you to do all of those things that I said before, but do it cheaper than you did it last year. Um, so they can avoid that next rate hike. Um, could you please go on to the next slide? Advancements in our field have helped to make this easier to do. Tools that the operator now has that they didn't have before, like SCADA, instrumentation, automation, are empowering tools for us to get this done because now we have access to data that we never had access to uh, 30 years ago. Um, and we have it in real time in a lot of cases that gives us the ability to be more cost effective and to run it better. But it's our job as the operator to not only get our supervisors and our board members or trustees on board and supportive of that, that you can run it cheaper than the engineers designed it originally. They give you the basic model. It's how you run it that is important. And SCADA isn't just supervisory control, it's data acquisition. And it's what you do with that data. You can just run an efficient plant as far as treatment capabilities, but it's also being able to run it cost effectively. Uh, that's important. Now this first slide that you're seeing here is of our uh, aeration tanks, our reactors, we have a uh, vertical loop reactor system. 70% of our mixing and aeration is through disc aerators, which you can see in the lower right hand corner here. Um, the way that we control with surface aeration, with disc aeration, 
in a, the, as much similar to an oxidation ditch is through the submergence of those aerators. So that the more you have it in the water, the more air it produces, the better mixing it produces. The less you have it in the water, the less air you get. It's just like turning up or turning down a blower. Blowers make up about 30% of the air need for these tanks. They just get it over the finish line. Now you'll notice some of these aerators are actually even off right now. Those are during the uh, anoxic section of the uh, process. Now, two of each of those, the lower two aerators in each reactor are constant speed. The top aerator is actually a variable speed drive. So it becomes like the jockey. It's the one that does most of the fine adjustment going for anywhere from 80% speed up to 100% speed. If once it's reached 100% speed and all three aerators are on, if more air is needed, that air valve up above will actually start opening and augmenting with blower air, with diffused air. So if you'll notice at the bottom there, you're seeing the amount of feet of water that's in the tank. Those are the, the tank water levels. And we have to be able to adjust that uh, we have to be able to adjust that to optimize the amount of air being provided. Now, how do we judge that? All right, with a blower, you've got a, an air meter that, that you can actually measure the amount of airflow going to the tank. But with a, with a, a surface aerator, uh, how do you judge your submergence? All right, the, submerge the total span of submergence on our disc aerators is only 11 inches. So we have to adjust based in real time on as much as 1.2 inches to make an increase or decrease. And the way our operators do that, if you'll notice on this disc aerator uh, uh, panel that I brought up, we actually monitor the current or amperage draw, the amount of work that that aerator is performing. If we see that it's getting closer to 15 amps, we know that most of that aerator is out of the water. All right, and it's not giving us, it's giving us minimal mixing and minimal aeration. If we see it's closer to 18 and a half amps, we see that it's doing all the work it can do. That's maximum submergence, it's maximum work. And our operators can use that because they can then see what it's doing uh, and make adjustments, fine adjustments in the amount of submergence in that tank by changing the level of the tank through those gates at the bottom to increase or decrease the amount of submergence. It gives the operator a tool to use in real time. And what you can't see in the upper corner there is that we can set it to within five hundredths of an inch as a target so that when more flow comes in, gates drop. When less flow is coming in, gates rise to maintain that level of submergence. Um, Keep in mind that SCADA is only as effective as the guy who's running it. Um, and it's also a tool that you can use that's a lot cheaper and easier to make a change in than, let's say, buying a new blower or a new pump. If you got to do those things, guess what? Or buy new lighting or buy, buy new equipment. Now you need engineers and you need contractors and everybody else. And it takes time and it can take a year or two years to get all that done. With SCADA, you go to the programmer and you start asking, well, can you make it do this? Can you make it, can you make it just do this for me? They love that. Keep in mind, the guy who made the program for this has no idea how to run a wastewater treatment plant in most cases. He's just, the engineer told him, can you make it do this? And he did that. You need to make him custom tailor the program to you. They can do it in real time. They can do it online. You can test theories. You can get more data from it. Uh, we are able to train to trend submergence versus aeration to give us uh, better ways to run the facility and easier ways to run the facility. If you want to move on to the next slide. Okay, this is our blowers. We actually have a pressure set point, and that's the way we control our blowers. We've created three different bands to give the operator choices. All right, and that air, each aerator band travels, uh, let's see, from band one's bottom end is about eight and a half PSI to band three, 
which is nine and a half PSI. Now, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. That's one PSI. But when you're talking about blowers of this size, one PSI can mean a tremendous amount of volume. More pressure means more volume. So by giving those minute controls to the operator, when flow starts increasing because of a rainfall event or that, they can increase the band from band two to band three, and the system will automatically adapt to that then. All right, instead of having to go down and take a guess at how much I need to turn this blower up or how much I need to turn this blower down or put an extra blower on, it avoids having to over aerate. When I first started in this business, you always turned the blowers up before you went home at night because you wanted to make sure you had enough air to get through the next morning uh, so that you weren't violating for ammonia nitrogen or something like that. Um, one of the things you don't see on here, which helps us overall optimize our maintenance. As Kamal was talking about earlier, um, there's different kinds of maintenance. When I first started into business, there were plants that ran RTF maintenance, which is run to failure. All right, run it till it has a problem. Most plants use preventative maintenance, which means that at so many hours or at so many months, I'm gonna change the oil in this blower, whether it needs to be changed or not, because I don't have the analysis for that, All right? We actually monitor the temperature of the oil in our blowers. When we start to see that temperature rise, because we've trended it against analysis, uh, we know when the lubricity is starting to break down. When the temperature starts rising, the lubricity of the oil is starting to drop down. Now it's time to change the oil. What that has meant is that we have almost doubled our time between oil changes without it being a problem, all right? We're not changing it before it needs to be changed. In these particular blowers, the manufacturer shipped us oil that he wanted us to use that was over $500 for two gallons, all right? So they loved us doing it on preventative maintenance, all right? They, they, uh, so by going to this, we're better using our maintenance guy's time. We're bringing down our maintenance costs we're driving maintenance based on the data coming from SCADA. Um, next slide, please. Another good example is at our headworks. Um, the grit chamber that is brought up here on your right, we're able to monitor the amount of amperage that it uses. Our operators over time have gotten to learn how to use that to see what that pump is doing about 13.5 to about 14 amps, that pump is pumping beautifully. If it starts pulling 15 or 16 amps, we know there's something in the pump, call maintenance. All right, you have a blockage. If it starts showing 12 and a half or 12 amps, either it's on air and it's not pumping or it's pumping very poorly and we've lost the pump efficiency. It's time to call maintenance to make an adjustment. The same as you would tune up a car because you want to improve the gas mileage on it. Not, it's still running, but you tune up that car because you're seeing that your gas mileage is dropping down. All right. The same thing happens here. All right. You don't wait until the pump is getting so off that it's noticeable, but we can monitor the pump efficiency, get our maintenance guys on it. They can come over, make a minor adjustment, restore the efficiency of the pump, and we're getting more bang from our kilowatt buck. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Okay, this is our influent pumps. We have vertical turbine pumps. These things are 23 feet below the deck. So monitoring their efficiency, you really, really better find out what you, that it needs to be maintained before you call a maintenance guy over. Uh, so what we do is trend our pump speed versus our gallons per minute output. When we see that GPM output start to drop down at that percentage of speed, we know that we're starting to lose pump efficiency and it can trigger that next maintenance. Now, well, we can move on to the next slide. This is our mixing building. Now this is smart management. We run from 7 a.m. in the morning until 11 p.m. at night. Now these are our sludge storage tanks and we mix these tanks about four hours a day. But to cut down on peak demand, 
rather than run them during the daytime when everything else is working, all of our buildings are occupied, the lights are all on, and we're doing the majority of the work, we actually run these at night. If you'll notice on the uh, upper left, we have a mixing time start around 8 p.m. at night, and then a mixing time stop at about midnight. And if you look to the right, the next one starts up one minute later. That way, one pump is not starting till the next pump has stopped or until the first pump has stopped. All right. By doing that, we reduce the amount of peak demand. We're also doing it at night when it's the lowest period of time that we're using electricity. So it cuts down on our peak demand overall in the facility. We actually even have, if you'll notice on the lower left, an auto fan control for the building that we run during the occupied shifts. We can set it to run as long or as short as we want because how many guys have had that operator that doesn't turn the vent fan off in the building? He turns it on, but he doesn't turn it off. I actually asked one guy, why don't you turn the vent fan on? And he says, well, it's, I mean, they got lots of money. <laughs> so, so it's getting your operators on board with that. But you can control these things. Move on to the next slide. This is where it really starts getting interesting. We use UV for disinfection. Now, each of those channels that you see, channels five, four, three, and two, why our engineers didn't start numbering at one, I don't know. That number one is our future channel. Uh, but each of those channels are 20 million gallons a day a piece. Um, and let's see, and there are almost 1,200 UV lamps contained in those. The state required that we um, this has really been a journey, and you'll see it in the next couple of slides. Uh, they required 100% redundancy. So all we actually needed was about 600 bulbs, but we actually had to have an entire additional system in each channel. So we worked with the manufacturer and said, what if we remove two of those four modules? And how, how would that change the hydraulic put profile and the put through? We still have out of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight modules. We've only removed two, but we've taken the put through of, that of each channel from 20 MGD to 26 MGD. Now you say, well, how's that significant? Well, I wasn't running the lights anyway, but what that does is it cuts down the number of times that you go from one channel to two channels or from two channels to three channels. Because when you kick on another channel, now you kick on a whole lot of lights, maybe at a low intensity, but you're still starting those lights up. That starts and stops on your lights. That's overdosing. Uh, so we cut our usage down significantly. And you'll see that in the last couple of slides. Um, we also use UVT to analyze. We compared UVT readings to our fecal coliform analysis. And through that, we were able to establish an actual chart that our operators could use in real time throughout the day to simply make adjustments. Oftentimes, a UV manufacturer will sell you equipment and say, here it is, turn it on, it disinfects. And if you would like, we'd be more than happy to optimize that for you. Nothing against, nothing against UV system manufacturers. Uh, but optimization really is the responsibility whether he gets it through the manufacturer or he does it himself or he does it through CDAC. the optimization of the facility's operation is your responsibility and if you don't you cannot do it I, I, I actually had the manufacturer tell me that a large um, company bought a UV system and just turn it on and turn everything on max all we want is disinfection that's all we care about all right, that's a lot of money. And you'll see that in the last two slides. Let's move on to the next slide. This is the UVT chart that I created for my guys. All right, it's very simple. They can simply look at what the UVT monitor is showing and set and do the dosage accordingly. When we started out in 2014, we were running at about 23 millijoules per centimeter squared. We, this last year, we were running anywhere from nine to seven. Uh, on most days. 
right? That saves and extends bulb life, that reduces maintenance time, and that increases, uh, and it still maintains compliance. Well, let's move on to the next slide because I'm taking too much time. Some of the simple things that you can do as an operator. IEC starters are much, much cheaper than NEMA starters, and they're smart. In the old days, you used to have to get an electrician to monitor your uh, amperage draw. OSHA will tell you you can't open that panel because you're not trained. But you can actually see these starters now, and they're smart. Auto restarts, sequential starting, staggered starts, all of this can be done at the panel now. You don't have to have a massive SCADA system. And now let's get to the payoff. That's the next slide. This was what our bills were for just the Spring Creek plant in 2014. You can actually see when the UV is turned on and when the UV is turned off. The highlighted area in red, we our disinfection season is from May to October. We usually started the bulbs about two weeks prior to make sure everything was in good running order before the season started. And you can see the significant rise in cost and demand. Now keep in mind, that's also the lowest flow period of the year. The high flow period is in January, February, and March, and also in October, November, and December. That's when the most I and I is coming in. And still, the UV was using that much. Now let's show the next slide, which will show you what we've reduced it to now. We are now saving, just from 2014 to today, $251,000 a year in electrical costs alone. That's not the maintenance savings. That's not the uh, cost of additional bulbs. This is just the kilowatt hours, the delivery costs, you can bring your fuel adjustment charges down, you can bring your demand down, and that's the payoff. Um, and as Robert and Kamal were both saying, it's tremendously important that you as an operator get access to those electric bills. I mean, that would be like being asked to run the treatment plant without any lab, lab data at all. How are you gonna control the product? I've got mixed liquor, I just don't know how much. All right, it looks pretty clean, but I'm not really sure if it's in compliance or not. The electric bill is the determination of how well you're doing. And it gives you the ability to see when you've made a change, what effect that change made. And it also helps sell the guys upstairs uh, on, do you wanna support me now that I'm saving you $250,000 a year? All right, and you don't need a new rate hike. Anyway. Uh, I've taken up too much time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian. You always have a, a wealth of great knowledge. And I think that this is just a great example of something that all operators can do that have UV and take into account the, the savings. I mean, that's incredible, $250,000 of annual savings just from that, you know, taking out the modules, looking at scheduling. Um, it's incredible. So thank you for sharing so much. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or the question and answer box. But we are going to move forward to our last presenter of today's webinar, uh, and that is Danny Blagojevich. So Danny is the Global Practice Leader for Treatment Optimization at Xylem. Danny's held various roles within water and energy and renewable energy space across heavily, heavy and light industry, energy utilities and water utilities at GE, Nalco Water, and Ecolab Company in Curly and Xylem. He brings hands-on industry and digital experience, having had an active role within the IIoT monitoring control and digital services space for quite some time, including development of commercialization, helping deliver ROI and driving business value. Currently, Danny comes from Xylem Digital Solutions, and Danny can be reached, and I will share his contact information in the chat. So, Danny, take it away. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, real quick, um, we all know some of the challenges uh, facing the water managers in the industry, right, from global megatrends, water challenges, daily activities of a water manager. And when you look at addressing these, the complexity comes in within organizations, right? Uh, you have uh, critical physical assets, you have data silos, everyone's on a certain uh, uh, point of this uh, digital transformation journey, 
right, working through their own strategy. Um, but what's clear is there's obviously, when you look at all the use cases across the value chain, there's an opportunity to do more. And, you know, previously we just heard on things like predictive maintenance, process optimization, and so forth. So the opportunity for the industry to transform as well as individual clients and, uh, you know, companies across not just water utilities, but across other industries in general is here and happening. And, you know, we spent time talking about data. And, you know, first thing is getting that visualization is like uh, Brian was talking about and being able to detect and predict. But really a lot of this, why, you know, is everyone investing a a lot in this is, you know, to help support transformational decision making, you know, making right decisions at the right time with the right insight. And, you know, combined with the reality that the work yesterday is not the work of today, like things are evolving. So, You know, everyone's looking to do things differently to become more efficient, mitigate risk. Um, And like Brian was saying, we'll optimize uh, when possible. Um, And what's clear is when you look across the water cycle, the key takeaway on this uh, slide is just the dramatic uh, improvements and better system controls, more efficient monitoring and diagnostics more targeted investments across the water cycle to kind of enable that transition to a holistic uh, model when we talk about system management, um, you know, across the the water cycle to enable that, uh, the journey to end state. And we call that approach uh, decision intelligence and, you know, kind of utilizing that framework in the upper right, sense, predict, act. And Before we get into details, we're going to give a couple of examples of digital solutions within the the treatment plant. But obviously, I threw this slide up here just to identify there's, like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of use cases within a wastewater treatment plant. Um, And no matter where you're at in your journey or how big or how mature some of your solutions are, there's an opportunity to to drive an outcome. this particular slide, this is not an uh, exhausted overview. It's not a tech stack of utility. Um, we're not going to get in the deep dive of the components of data visualization or business intelligence systems or APM, enterprise asset management, workforce management, nor are we going to talk about mixed reality supporting the remote uh, repair and maintenance. But it's kind of a simplified overview to help kind of highlight, you know, you have field devices and equipment, you have that intelligent equipment, the advanced control where you can help drive an outcome. On top of that, you have asset performance management type systems that look to improve the reliability and availability of the asset while mitigating cost and risk basically kind of applying predictive analytics software to real-time data to optimize the health performance and maintenance and the same thing on top of that um, operational optimization uh, applying for whether it's uh, process optimization on a unit process across the whole plant so when you think about it in the buckets no matter where you're at again you have intelligent equipment some advanced automation control you could do things around the asset performance management piece, uh, like was discussed earlier in the presentation. And what we'll dive into now is some something on operational optimization. But I thought I'd show this slide just as a way of thinking about some of the use cases. So um, real-time decision support systems. Uh, effectively, uh, plant optimization software to help utilities simulate and efficiently manage the most complex biological and chemical processes, basically helping treatment plant operators deliver better water at lower cost with minimal effort. So uh, think of this analogous to a navigation app. Uh, You know, given current and expected traffic conditions, how do I get home fastest going from point A to point B? And same thing on a treatment plant. Given the current and expected wastewater conditions, how do I operate the treatment plant to not only improve my operations to reduce energy and chemical consumption, but also make sure that we're maintaining compliance. So looking through, running through a bunch of 
uh, numerous scenarios, given certain conditions, making recommendations and predictions on air flow rates or research rates, et cetera, all while maintaining compliance and driving that outcome of reduction of energy and chemical consumption. And how do we do that? Um, utilizing the same framework of sense, predict, app, act is, you know, the first point of this is kind of, uh, you think of it as kind of turn on the light. You know, we talked about previously about the data collection, you know, integrating into SCADA, establishing some real-time alerts. Uh, the next step is to create a digital twin. Uh, you're assimilating data uh, of the past. You're running real-time models and you're recalibrating that model based on demand. And then the act part is it's running through a thousand different scenarios. The end goal is to reduce energy and chemicals. And the other thing it's also doing is providing uh, improved operations, whether that's through guidance mode or automatic control plan. Um, and that integrates, and obviously the sense part is in some cases, you know, the opportunity to install some sensors to help turn on the lights if needed um, is also an opportunity to gain visibility into your system as well. And here's just a use case of a client that was looking to reduce uh, energy in their aeration system, but a key aspect was obviously wanting to maintain compliance and implementing the solution uh, in terms of the plant optimization software uh, received a reduction of energy that you see on the screen there. Um, again, starting with the discovery to make sure um, through that process that everyone was on the same page in terms of what outcomes we wanted to drive, uh, but that was the uh, end state and the result of the implementation of the plan optimization software. Now, clearly, when you think about, uh, like in the previous slide, what are some other use cases to apply optimization? Kind of talked through it earlier, but think about, uh, you know, you're either removing, I like to look at it, you're kind of removing pain or you're kind of trying to achieve gain. Um, so there's other opportunities within the plant, polymer optimization, phosphorus reduction, maybe chlorination, disinfection. So this approach can be applied in the specific uh, unit process or obviously uh, wider than that across the plant. Um, you know, and next, um, you know, we talk about asset management, going back to that previous slide, right? Intelligent equipment, some advanced automation and control. And then we talked about asset management and operational optimization. This is kind of like an example of some uh, simplistic solution of being able to monitor your diffusers, basically make recommendations when to clean or replace your diffusers and indicate potential en en energy savings with replacement or cleaning of diffusers. Obviously, if the diffusers are um, dirty, obviously you're, us you can, you're using more energy, right, to do the work. So this is an opportunity just to gain visibility um, into your system and some, something that's uh, e easier to deploy. Then, so the point of the story here is you don't have to go like full blown with a big solution right away. It's all whether you're just beginning your journey or you know accelerating through the journey, and whether you're the maturity of your systems, no matter where they're at, there's opportunities to drive some outcomes uh, wherever you're at. I kind of went kind of fast, Kathy. I wanted to leave some time for the webinar for questions. Um, well, thank you so much, Danny. This was really great too. And I think it just reinforced everything that was discussed today, um, as well as talked about some different unique solutions. You know, we've kind of run the scale from, you know, simply looking at data and doing analysis all the way to different technology systems and what we can use. And, um, you know, the treatment optimization of Sense at Predict Act as you're showing up here. So there's a lot, 
you know, there's a wide gamut, I think, is what we wanted to share with you today of different ways that you can um, start um, using data to optimize your operations and reduce energy. But there's a lot of more complex and smart um, AI systems, too, that you can look into as well. So thank you so much, Danny, for your presentation today. Um, I am going to just make a shameless uh, plug uh, before we get into our uh, chat. Um, if you are interested in an assessment to take a look at some more of these opportunities specific to your wastewater treatment facility, we do offer no cost uh, um, energy assessments for your plant. So um, there is, um, you know, the e Illinois EPA um, Office of Energy will have another funding opportunity opening up soon. So make sure if, if it's not through us, through your um, partner consultant or engineer, get an assessment, see what opportunities are available. Um, you know, we can look at things like cost of upgrades, payback period, other, and other incentives and ways that we can help you get this done within your facility. So um, just uh, use the website here, cdac.org slash wastewater for more information. And now I will open it up to questions. And um, so we did get some questions in the chat. And uh, one of them, uh, let me see here. Our first question was actually answered by Robert, but I want to reiterate it in case you had not um, seen it. Um, is there a way to measure flow through a lift station that doesn't have flow monitoring so you can track flows versus precipitations for lift stations? Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, you can take the characteristics of the pump. You, 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 you know, the, the energy consumption for the pumps is known. Uh, that comes from the utility. And you can take the uh, characteristics of that pump that, um, uh, and, and convert that basically to flow. But really, I would start out by just uh, charting um, energy consumption versus precipitation and see what that shows. Uh, without even bothering going through the calculations. Um, and that really should show you those lift stations that are pumping uh, or, or increasing pumping quite a bit during wet periods. So that way you could start to identify which uh, trunk lines uh, or which branches feeding into the trunk lines uh, are, are seeing undue uh, or more than you'd like infiltration. You, it's a way of prioritizing. Awesome. And Danny and, and Brian might be able to add to that. <clears throat> Any additional comments? Okay. Well, we have another question here. Would it be all possible to extract all SCADA data or customize the system by contacting the developer? Brian's shaking his head, yes. <laughs> That's beyond yeah. that, me. You know what? It, it, <clears throat> I look on um, our relationship with our SCADA provider and uh, as kind of a marriage, if you will. Uh, he's the first guy we go to. All right. Instead of going back to engineers, if I need a redesign, I go to engineers. All right. But if I need to change the operation to try and make it a little bit friendlier, um, a little bit more usable, you go back to your SCADA programmer. Um, also, when you're if you're adding a new system and there's a PLC involved, make sure that you have a copy of that program that you can turn over to your integrator. All right, so that if you want to see a change in a PLC that governs a particular process or piece of equipment, you can make that change. We actually have a way for our SCADA people to log in. They're out of Bloomington, and we actually can remote them in. So response time is almost immediate, uh, which really bothers them a lot because uh, for the first five years of operation, I was on the phone with them almost every other day. Hey, can you make it do this? All right. And then they they love that, though. The, the programmer himself loves that because that's a challenge. Um, and we actually kept them on retainer and have kept them on retainer just, just because those changes can be made without a construction permit without EPA uh, having to look over the drawings, without engineers, to, uh, you're, what you're doing is you're just changing the cruise control. You're, 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 you're speeding it up and you're locking it in at 65 instead of 55. So yes, 
it's very easy to change the programming. It's just unfortunate. A lot of times guys get go into a plant and they see, they, they, they say, well, that's what, they, that's what I was given. So I got to operate it this way. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. The other one thing I'd add to Brian from my end is uh, some of these this digital solutions. One thing to keep in mind is they leverage your existing infrastructure. So in other words, whether it's something complex like AI based optimization or something like real time control or something like intelligent equipment, some advanced control that you're tweaking, the, the bottom line is that most of them by and large integrate with your existing infrastructure. So exactly. that, that's a key thing to articulate because you don't have to like reinvest or tweak things on your end or talk to corporate on what the cloud right. strategy is or whatever like that. It's more about leveraging existing investments. And we get reports from our SCADA system showing pumpage, showing electrical consumption, all of that, you know, flows, not just flow data for the monthly report or the DMR, but also data that we can use to trend ourselves to make adjustments to the process to better optimize the system. Awesome. Thank you for your responses. And if anybody has any questions, um, just to let you know, we are uh, at our time. So if you do have to leave us, I understand. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, but we will uh, send the recording out. We're gonna stay on just for a few minutes longer. Um, and if you can stick with us, join us. Um, we have a couple more questions um, to review. And um, again, we'll send out the recording. So if you miss it, um, you can definitely refer back to it later. Um, and I think there was a clarification to a question about um, considering loads when the correlation of flow and energy. Um, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about how we how we judge kind of flow uh, rates when we look at um, kind of energy use and that trend analysis that you were describing before? We take what comes out of the DMRs that we get uh, from the operators, and that's that's what we use, and that takes into uh, account the uh, changing climatic conditions. So, when a rainfall happens, that appears in the DMR data. Great. Okay. I, I'd like to say one other thing too, real quick. Uh, one of the points that Danny made at the very end is very important that you don't have to go full blown SCADA. You know, there are other things you can do too, that uh, uh, other tools that you can use, other systems that you can integrate into your wastewater treatment plant that don't require a sophisticated SCADA system for those of you that don't have one or don't have the money for one or something along those lines. I think that was an important point, Danny. Definitely, definitely. And there's a lot of different solutions out there um, that are available to fit your, fit your needs too. And um, I think another good point is, you know, you can start small too, you know, start tracking a little bit of your data, start maybe implementing a couple monitors here and there, you know, starting, so you can start small, you don't have to go um, big right off the start and you can kind of ease your way into that as well. I know um, Brian, uh, you're a big advocate for that as well. Just starting, starting somewhere. <laughs> exactly. You can start very small. One of the last slides that I showed was simply where we had a NEMA starter, which is for lack of a better way of describing it, a very stupid starter. All right. It's a very tough starter. Don't get me wrong. It can take short circuit and everything else, but an IEC starter has so much potential. Even if you don't have a SCADA system, just the ability for an operator to see how many amps the thing is drawing while it's in operation is a tremendous help on letting him know whether the pump is blocked, it's on air, it's lost its efficiency, it needs to be maintained, it needs to be lubed. Uh, it, it, you can start out very, very small and, and very, very cheap but and, and build on that impact. It's a journey. It's not a destination. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I know we are nearing close to our time and we don't have many more questions. Um, so I wanna ask our panelists, any final words? I know that was a kind of a good final statement, Brian, but any anyone else on our team as well as Brian, if you wanna chime in, anything else you wanna leave our audience with today um, about using data and optimizing your, your plant maintenance for better efficiency?
Well, for for uh, our audience, thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, it, it it just to reiterate, it can start very simply. It does not have to be very complex. Uh, you have some of the data, or it should be made available to you from uh, your clerk or whoever gets those utility bills. The operator should have those a copy of those bills. Those are incredibly important. Uh, it's it's the first step, really. Thank you, Robert. Anyone else have some final words? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you mm -hmm. to Brian and to Danny for joining thank us you. as well. We appreciate you being on the webinar. Robert and Kamau, thank you as well from our team here at CDAC for doing a great job presenting. Again, if you're interested in CEUs or professional development hour certificates, um, please email me at cassie at cdac.org and I can get those for you. Uh, thank you again. I will send out all the slides and the recording of today's webinar uh, probably within the next couple of days to everybody. But thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, those who have also joined the entire series of webinars. This concludes our fall webinar series for the Illinois EPA Wastewater Treatment Plant Energy Efficiency program. Uh, and I thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, guys. Thank you.